Hey everybody, welcome to our continuing discussion of sensation and perception. This time we're talking through hearing. So hearing or audition is our ability to perceive um, condensations and rarefications in air, right? Basically waves pushed through the medium of the air around us. So the frequency of a waveform corresponds to our perception of peach, pitch. So a um, low frequency waveform like this with slow a uh, waveform with lots of distance between the peaks will sound like a low frequency or a low pitched sound. So frequency is the physiological quality. How frequent are the waveforms? And pitch is the psychological quality. How high pitched or low pitched is the sound? Song to sound the sound sound to us. You can hear high frequency right with the peaks uh, more clustered together. Will result in a high pitched sound. Amplitude is the um, physical quality of the wave, right? High amplitude, big peaks versus low peaks for low amplitude. High amplitude waveform has a loud sound, so high volume, whereas a low amplitude waveform produces a soft sound. The perception of timbre is a little bit more complicated to explain. So if, for example, you're listening to someone play a cello, it's a very distinct sound, right? Um, Somebody plays a middle, a middle C note on a cello, you can tell instantly that it is not a middle C note on a piano or a trumpet, D despite the fact that they're going to have the same frequency, right? They're the same pitch. They might even be the same loudness, but they sound different, right? Like a cello sounds cello-y. It doesn't sound like anything else. So why? Well, timbre is a combination of the fundamental frequency, which is the lowest, usually most intense frequency of a sound. So over here we have our fundamental frequency, which is sort of this high amplitude, most intense um, portion of the waveform, right? It's perceived as the sound's basic pitch, so this would be a, a middle C in the example that we're talking about. And there's a, then there's um, combinations of overtones, right? These are frequencies of complex tones that occur at multiples of the fundamental frequency. And the pattern of overtones uh, changes based on what's making that tone. So the unique combination of the fundamental frequency and all of these overtones are produce the unique um, cello waveform, right? Or in this example, clarinet waveform. Um, so that's why, you know, sounds sound different to us, right? Despite things having the same pitch and maybe the same loudness, um, the reason our voices sound different, the reason instruments sound different is that combination of these uh, complex multiplicative tones, the overtones that occur in addition to the fundamental frequency. All right, let's talk a little bit about audition and spatial location. Um, I really like this concept. This is something we're surprisingly really, really good at. It's one of those amazing perceptual abilities we all have and we never think about. Um, the example I would always use in class for this is I would ask everyone to close their eyes and then I would take a pencil and throw it into the middle of the room. It doesn't make a loud noise, but it makes a noise. And I would ask everyone, as soon as you hear something, point at where you think that was. And without fail, Everyone in the class points very precisely to exactly where the pencil is sitting. People wake up and they're kind of surprised, like, oh wow, I did a really great job localizing that. Um, we're really, really, really pretty good at this spatial location stuff. And here's how that works. So, as you know, your ears are not really close together, right? You have one on each side of your head. And this gives us a couple of cool things that we can do. There's a phase difference. Right? We have simultaneous arrival at each ear of different portions of an oscillating sound wave. So, um, basically you picture a wave as sort of a waveform, right? Ups and downs that are pretty regular. You can imagine if your ears are kind of, you know, not in exactly the same location, that sound wave is going to hit both of them at a different point in phase of that. Right? So you're going, it's going to um, maybe be at the peak when it hits here and then in a valley when it hits over on your other ear. And because of the fact that there is a slight phase difference when those waveforms are hitting two different points on your head, which is tiny, right? You can still use that to give yourself information about how far away something is. And, and we're sort of demonstrating that concept with the, the figure uh, down here. Uh, there's also the concept of a sound shadow which is um, the fact that your head is a big thing that takes up space and sound doesn't propagate very nicely through your head, right? Uh, the vibrations moving through the air don't move as nicely through your big meaty head. So 
your head creates a small sound shadow. So if sound is hitting you from this side, it's going to be slightly quieter on this side of your head because your head has dampened it. So between uh, phase differences and the creation of a sound shadow, um, we can localize objects in space really nice. Okay, so how do we hear? Well, it all begins with our outer ear, right? The pinna is this fleshy outer portion of your ear. Let's collect sounds. Um, and uh, we also have our ear canal right here, which is this portion um, which is still part of the outer ear. Um, and it ends with our eardrum. So the pinna sort of collects sound, funnels it into our ear canal, which then causes our eardrum to vibrate. Next is our middle ear, which serves to amplify sound waves. And it consists of our three small bones, which are ossicles, which are called uh, colloquially the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. These are also known as the incus, malleus, and stapes bones. Um, so these basically convert the vibration of the air into the physical motion of these bones. And these bones push onto the cochlea, which is this weird snail-like structure that contains uh, fluid. The uh, sound is transduced by the motion in this fluid into neural impulses. So here's a closer look at that. So here are the sound waves coming in through our ear canal. They cause the eardrum to vibrate, which then in turn causes the um, ossicles in your middle ear to uh, vibrate. The stirrup here is pushing on the oval window of the cochlea. Uh, it's been sort of uncurled here, so you can see it a little bit better. But we have this fluid that fills the cochlea, which then transfers the motion, right? We have a waveform that is then translated into motion of this fluid, which makes its way around the cochlea all the way down here. Um, we have another membrane here that allows a little bit of movement, so there's somewhere for that vibration to occur. Uh, in between the layers of this fluid, we have hair cells. And these hair cells are what's uh, going to be doing the signal transduction. Here we have our auditory nerve. These fibers from the auditory nerve receive input from those hair cells. So zooming in a little bit more once again, here is our Yet another diagram of our middle ear and our inner ear. You can see the motion transferred through here and making its way around as this fluid um, carries the waveform and vibrates. It causes this membrane here, this basilar membrane, to vibrate. Um, and basically what happens is you've got these hair cells that are embedded in the um, tectoral membrane and their bases are found on the basilar membrane. And you can sort of think of this um, like it's going to cause these hair cells to be pulled, right? The hair is sort of embedded in this top of this tectoral membrane. So if it's embedded sort of like this, like my hair is in my hand embedded in the tectoral membrane, you can imagine that when the basilar membrane goes down, it's going to cause the hair to be pulled. So as the basilar membrane moves up and down, the hair gets pulled as it's embedded in the tectoral membrane. That is going to cause um, the perception of that mechanical stress is going to cause transduction to happen in these cells. These cells are going to be excited by that transduction process, and that stimulation is going to carry its way down into the auditory nerve. So that's a super weird system. Basically, we're taking air vibrations, converting them into bone movement, which is converted into vibrations carried through this fluid at the cochlea, also, we can vibrate this basilar membrane and pull these hair cells, which are what's going to cause the uh, signal to be translated from a mechanical stimulus into a neurochemical stimulus. So how do we use that information? How do we make sense of hairs being pulled in our cochlea and turn that into something useful? There's two complementary theories that describe how the basilar membrane works in terms of transmission of differently pitched sounds. Yeah, so how do we, how do we translate pitch into into a neural impulse that we can understand. Well, there's the frequency theory. The basilar membrane vibrates at the same frequency as the sound wave. Discrimination, this allows us to discriminate low frequency sounds. It's important to note that hair cells can fire in volleys. You may remember from our discussion of the action potential that cells are limited in how quickly they can fire. They can only fire so many times per second. So the volley principle gets around this. A population of hair cells will fire in sort of like a volley, right? One will fire, then one will fire shortly after, then one will fire shortly after that, allowing the first one to rest and then fire again. Taken as a unit, 
evolving population of hair cells can create a much higher frequency representation than one cell firing alone. There's also the place theory. This is the theory that different frequencies cause larger vibrations at different locations along the basilar membrane. Uh, this allows for discrimination of higher pitches. Basically, the way that the membrane is organized is that stimulation of different portions of the length of that membrane will be coded as different uh, frequencies, different pitches of sound. Um, so stimulation at one end will cause a low sound and at the other end will cause a perception of a high sound. So this works well for higher frequency sounds which cannot be possibly be coded even with volleying firing of cells. Uh, both theories, however, involved an intermediate frequency that codes for mid-range pitches. So let's talk about the pathway here very briefly. Those sound waves, through the process of transduction that we just discussed, become neural impulses. Those neural impulses are carried via the auditory nerve to the thalamus and are then projected onto the temporal lobe for further processing. Uh, the right ear is projected to the left temporal lobe and the left ear is projected to the right temporal lobe. So decibels are a unit that we often use to measure the psychological loudness of a sound. So zero decibel is the lowest sound that's audible to a human ear. Something like uh, 30 decibels is a quiet, uh, soft whisper. 70 is busy traffic or a noisy restaurant. Um, you can extreme experience some danger with constant exposure at this level. Um, and here we can see going up and up, uh, we can suffer uh, hearing loss with various levels of um, sound, right? So being too close to a chainsaw or a drill for about two hours without hearing protection can cause damage. Uh, likewise, a, uh, speakers at a rock concert that are extremely loud at 120 decibels or a thunderclap can cause immediate danger. And then for say, extreme example, being on a rocket launching pad with a 180 decibel blast is going to cause immediate hearing loss. So let's talk a little bit about hearing loss. There's two types of hearing loss that we will discuss. There's conductive hearing loss. Uh, this is when the middle ear isn't conducting sound well to the cochlea, um, meaning that basically the sound is being muffled um, from damage. A uh, solution to this can be a hearing aid which sort of amplifies the sound and can facilitate that conduction. There's also sensio, sensio, sensio neuronal hearing loss. Sorry, sensio neuronal hearing loss. Uh, this is when the receptor cells aren't sending messages through the auditory nerve. This one's a bit harder to fix, right? But we do have one solution, which is a cochlear implant, which is a really, really amazing piece of technology. The cochlear implant is basically a microphone and a signal processor coupled with an electrode array. So we have this microphone and signal processor out here, and then we have an electrode array, which is actually inserted into the cochlea. This follows the uh, snail-like curl and rests upon the entire basilar membrane. And what happens is electrodes will stimulate different portions of the membrane uh, according to the signals that are sent by the microphone and signal processor. So this takes advantage of the what we would call tonotopic organization that we have in the uh, cochlea. Because it is so reliably organized, um, the processor can take those signals and translate those into electrical impulses along the length of the cochlea and produce the psychological qualities that those sounds uh, are, are producing. So it bypasses um, the defective bit of circuitry and allows certain people with certain types of central hearing loss to uh, be able to experience uh, audition once again. All right, and that is it for our discussion of uh, the hearing sense. Next time we're going to be talking about taste.